If I haven't met you, I want to say welcome to Fellowship Fayetteville. I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here on a great pastoral team. Uh, my name's Clark, and uh, welcome to Fellowship Fayetteville, Father's Day edition. And uh, I do want to say a personal thank you uh, to Tom and Robin. And Ro- Tom, I wasn't going to tell you I was going to do this, but um, Tom and Robin are intentional as parents, and you're an intentional father. And so I'm glad you're here today because you need to hear that, and your, your daughter needs to hear that, and she knows it. And um, you're also intentional with the gospel, and this is the fruit of it. And he turns conversations to conversations about Jesus, and I appreciate that about you. You're also intentional as a prayer warrior. We get these texts that are a mile long, right? I don't know how you type that fast. And they're prayers for our pastoral team. And so I appreciate that about you. Tom and Robin, next Monday, are moving back to Texas. We're sending these Aggies back, right? And uh, Tom and Robin, you're watching. I want to pray for you guys. And I want to say thank you publicly for your investment in the next generation in your home, your investment in our church, and your future investment in the state of Texas. They need the gospel too, right? Yeah, let's pray for them. Father, uh, thank you for the good work of your son, Jesus, on behalf of Tom and Robin and their family. Thank you for multiplying the gospel through generations inside our church, inside the school community in Northwest Arkansas, inside the real estate community in Northwest Arkansas, inside the political community of Northwest Arkansas, Um, for their influence. God, we pray that you would give them grace as they transition, restore friendships there, help them find a church that magnifies Jesus and teaches your word. And God, we thank you for the gift they've been to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Hey, as it is Father's Day, I I would like to just a a brief note. This is my fourth Father's Day since my father uh, went home to be with the true father, and, uh, and so he's having a good dad's day for sure. Um, my dad came to Christ when he was 16. Some street evangelists were sharing the gospel in a parking lot on a Friday night in Little Rock, Arkansas, and my dad and a couple of his buddies, they put their faith in Christ that night. My dad had a lot of ups and downs, spiritually speaking, um, through his walk over the years, and I wanna encourage you just briefly, um, if you're an older father, If you're more seasoned in your years, I want to encourage you with this. You see, my dad, in and through his ups and downs, I think he realized that people were complicated, and we are, right? And it was just easier, or so it seemed, to go at it alone. So he began to back away from people. And I think he realized um, in that kind of life that he was likely the complicated one, as you are and as I am. And when he turned 66, he stepped out in a vulnerable position as someone in that generation as well, and he joined a step study here at Fellowship Fave. I'm not going to mention the leader, but I'm forever grateful for him as well. And he opened himself up to this recovery process. He got in a men's small group that he was a part of until the Lord took him home at 71. And so if you've been praying for your dad, I don't want you to give up. Keep praying for him. If you find yourself like my dad in that season of your life and you're alone, I want to ask you to be vulnerable and encourage you to step out. It doesn't have to be a step study like what he got in, but get into a men's group. And to God's glory, to my dad's initiative, he finished well. I want every dad in here to finish well. Can we do that together? Let's do that. Well, so grateful for my dad and and what he instilled into me. He gave me a love for the outdoors. And uh, I really think, let's just end it with this, that as my dad aged, the condemnation that he felt gave way to God's great and secure love in his latter years. And that's something to be celebrated on this Father's Day. Keep praying for your dad. Well, controversy. Uh, There's no shortage of it in our culture today, and if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 11. 
We're going to be in verses 27. We're going to pick up where we left off last week, and we're going to go to 1227. Now, we're, not, we're going to do a flyover, and we're going to drop up. I've got some summary slides to help guide you if you're a note taker. You're going to like that, I think. Um, we're not going to have time to go into every, there's four different stories here, okay? But Jesus is in controversy with the leadership of the Jews as he makes his way to the cross. And this word controversy in our culture, there's no shortage of it, obviously. The word itself, um, it comes from this idea. It's the, the, the word origin itself comes from a Latin word contra, means against, versus, contra against, versus to turn, to turn against. That's what's happening. The Jewish leaders are turning against him, and then he's turning against them and calling them out. Words like argument or debate or dissension, contention, those are other words we use. But the definition of prolonged, public, and heated disagreement. Have we had some of those in our culture as of late? Whether, and it's some of the more recent ones, whether it's the, the ethical considerations of AI, what is free speech, healthcare reform, immigration reform, prison reform, the legalization of marijuana, cloning, legalized gambling, global warming, even now, um, the idea that student athletes are now going to be compensated. That's been somewhat controversial in, 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 in a lighter way for many of you. But inside the church at large, there's also controversies, uh, different views of creation. How did God create us? Um, different views of the end times, birth control, vaccinations, public, private, homeschool. Anybody had that argument as of late? Those are controversies. Or if you remember four years ago, there was something called mask or no mask. Should we go there this morning? I, I put on my mask the other day when I was mowing because I knew I was teaching and I didn't want to, I wanted to be able to teach. <laughs> and uh, I just twitch. It's like, all these emails started coming back to me, you know? And uh, no lie, one of you walked into our building when we came back, looked at one of our staff, and said, it'll be a cold day in before I worship my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with a mask on. You wanna know who it is? <laughs> no. <laughs> And then we had another family that, um, in a humble way, they decided to leave because we weren't enforcing keeping your mask on during the whole service. And they didn't think we were taking it serious. Do y'all remember those days? Inside the church, there was controversy. And I was one. My mom was in an assisted living facility at the time. I was trying to take that serious. My dad was going through chemo treatments for brain lymphoma, um, his immune system was weak, and so in our home, we took it serious, but we also tried to keep our focus on Jesus, and in a church of many followers of Jesus from different perspectives, there was controversy that we had to navigate through, and today we find Jesus in controversy. He's up against someone. They're up against him. It's public. There's disputing. There's rebuke, and I think this verse sums up the pivot that has happened. And this is after he drove them out of the temple. The chief priests and the teachers of the law, they heard this, they began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And this morning, I'm gonna go ahead and just give you the big idea. We believe that Jesus is both the source of and the solution to controversy. The source of and the solution to controversy. Controversy, And so here in Mark eleven twenty seven, we're gonna fly over four scenes where Jesus confronts Jewish leadership. But I think it's important, and this is gonna feel a little bit more classroomy, okay, on Father's Day, so if you're taking notes, these are the parties involved in Jesus' controversy. And I wanna just give you a rundown of who they are. If you've wondered, who are they? The only ones I really know are the Pharisees. Well, the chief priests, they were appointed by the Roman governor. Just remember them, upkeep of the temple, order of the people. Upkeep of the temple, order of the people. Those are the chief priests. The scribes or the teachers of the law in some of your versions. 
the writers, the teachers of the law, they were influential interpreters. The elders were older men, obviously, who formed the ruling elite. The Pharisees that most of us are familiar with committed to the law. So much so, so they added additional requirements and restrictions to keep people from breaking the law. But Jesus saw many of them as hypocrites who twisted the intent of the law, and they used it for their own gain. We have a brief run-in with this group called the Herodians. They were supporters of King Herod, who was probably the most politically aligned um, with Rome in their time. If you remember Herod, he killed the male children under two when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. His son would have John the Baptist killed. That's Herod. So there's that line. He was king over the, the region of Galilee. And then we have the Sadducees. They only believed that the law of Moses, the Pentateuch, your first five books of the Bible, were the word of God. That's where it stopped for them. They were always in conflict with the Pharisees, and they didn't believe that our bodies would be raised again in the afterlife. And the scripture notes that in our passage today. And so those are the primary religious people and the spiritual shepherds um, that he confronts here And I think it's important for us to note, we're here in church. I know many of you wouldn't consider yourself a religious person, but we do have a lot of spiritual shepherds or leaders in here. Jesus' most pointed rebukes in the scriptures are actually not to pagan authorities and cultures. They're to those who take care of God's people. And you see that here in a very pointed way. And so we're going to pick it up in our first scene, Mark 11. Let's go, Mark 11, 27 uh, to 33. He's back in Jerusalem. He's walking in the temple courts, chief priests, teachers of law, scribes, elders. They ask him this question. By what authority are you doing these things, this ministry? And who gave you the authority to do this? And Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I'll tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism, that baptism of repentance when Jesus came, Was it from heaven or of human origin? Tell me. Uh, Now, now to be fair and to just give them a little bit of place here, the Jewish authorities, it was their responsibility to protect the people from false messiahs, okay? They were supposed to guard against that. They're supposed to prevent the misuse of Scripture and to protect the temple. They're guarding things. They've got legitimate questions, but what you'll see in the Gospels as it plays out Their motives are called into question, and Jesus can see into the heart. He can see the thing behind the thing, and as they unfold, you'll see this more and more, and they were tasked with keeping revolutionaries at bay so they can stay in power, if you will, and have some freedom of autonomy under Rome's control. Well, he does what many of the rabbis did then, is he he answers their question with a question. It was a common way to have a conversation. Uh, They would have understood this technique, and he does that, and he backs them into a conundrum here. You see it in the text here. He says, if we say from heaven, then he's going to ask, well, why didn't you believe him? If we say from human origin, they feared the people. You're going to see that as a theme. For everyone held that John really was a prophet. So they answered, we don't know. His response, well, neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing this. Consider the conundrum. If they say from heaven and they're standing there in disbelief, then they just did not affirm John's followership of Jesus and his authority and his baptism, okay? When they did that, and if they confirm that he was from heaven, then they're held liable for their own unbelief as they stand before him. If they say he was human All the Jewish people believed he was a prophet, and they would lose favor with them, and so they find themselves torn. And what you'll see, the pattern in with the religious leaders is they they walk in fear of the people, they walk in fear of Rome, but they lack a fear of who Jesus is, is one of the common things that you'll see in them. If you were going to summarize, and we'll have a slide for each little section here, these are the characters, the controversy. Where does Jesus' authority come from? That word authority, we've been looking at since week one is one of the primary themes 
of our study in the Gospel of Mark. The conclusion, we don't know. And then the fear of the people. On the scene too, and this is what Judy read, our scene that we call a parable. Now, a parable is another teaching method. It's really cool. You get to see how Jesus teaches people and rebukes people appropriately in different ways here. Parables in the New Testament were used to reveal truth to his followers. They were also used to conceal truth to those who had hard hearts. They were used to teach ministry principles or spiritual principles, and in this case, used to rebuke others. And in this parable, he uses imagery and characters that they would have been familiar with. This imagery of a vineyard, and I want you to write next where it says that he began to speak to them in parables, right? Isaiah 5, 1 through 7. They would have understood that God has likened Israel to a vineyard. So they would have understood this context. And so what I want to do is briefly, I want to summarize what Judy read. A man plants a vineyard. He hires some farmers or tenants to take care of it and produce fruit with it. He wants a return on his planting. And so he sends messengers their way. He sends servants or slaves, depending on what your version is in the scripture, to collect from them the fruit, okay? Progressively, one by one, they beat up, they eventually kill those that he keeps sending. And then, they, and then the farmer, the, the vineyard owner, sends his son. And they kill him and they cast him out of the vineyard. Now, just in summary, the vineyard owner would be Yahweh, God. The tenants, farmers, Jewish leadership. They totally understood him to be calling them out here. Servants, the prophets of God who said judgment was coming or blessing was coming if you would obey. There's a Messiah coming. And then the son, we understand. And even the word that's used in here says beloved. The beloved son represents Jesus, the son. He goes on in this parable when he says what they did with him. They took him They threw him out of the vineyard, and what would the owner of the vineyard do? He's going to come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? Jesus confronts them with the word of God. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and he brings up another image, this one of building, this cornerstone idea. Now, this is really cool. Psalms 113 through 118 are called the Hillel Psalms. They were primarily used and recited during Passover week. Guess what's happening in Jerusalem while he's confronting them with this parable? Passover week. He's so in the moment and bringing the past to the present to call them on the carpet. And as they stand there before him, the religious leaders, this is their rejection moment. And then it even says he had spoken the parable against them, but they were afraid again of the crowd. This is obviously the most pointed of our stories today in terms of how they received it. And this is also why context matters. This is one of those parables that's written to them. He's speaking to them, but it's for us. This is one of those context opportunities where you don't take this parable and go, oh, am I going to be the one killed and thrown out of the vineyard, okay? Now, there is judgment that comes for those who don't believe in Christ. All through the New Testament, we understand that to be true, okay? But specifically in this passage, he's speaking of Jewish leadership who have abdicated their authority, and they've been very poor shepherds of the people of Israel, the chief priest, in summary, the teachers of the law, the elders, Jesus confronts their failed leadership. Once again, it's an issue of authority. And they look to arrest. What's one of the themes we see? They fear the crowd. So he's confronted the issue of authority. He's confronted their failed leadership. And now we're going to get into government and money. Right? Happy Father's Day. Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians. So they're sending them in, in waves, different groups of people. 
to catch him in his words. That word catch, it's like a predator trapping their prey, setting a trap for them to catch him in his words. Now, this is interesting to me because if you understand their motive and what Jesus is about to confront them on, it's, it comes across as flattery. But no truer words have ever been spoken about someone than these words. We know that you are a man of integrity. This is Jesus, right? That's true. Because you paid no attention. You're not swayed by others. This is true of Jesus, which interestingly enough, they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. True words have never been spoken. Because of that, should we pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew the thing behind the thing. He knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? Bring me a denarius. Let me look at it. They brought it to him. Whose image? Caesar's image. And he said to them, get back to Caesar. What is Caesar? And to God, what is God's? And they were amazed. That word amazed can also be used wonder. They just step back and wonder. They're not worshiping, but they're in awe. They can't catch him in the trap. Now, this is controversial for a variety of reasons. One, to pay the imperial tax as a Jew would have been a sign that you're paying homage to a pagan ruler as Lord. This would be seen as treason by a Jew. Okay? Most Jewish people and leaders despise Roman rule and oppression. To not pay could warrant the charge of sedition, cause arrest, and possibly death. This is quite a conundrum. You see, even the Jews, many of them refused to carry the coins in their pockets or with them. Rome even gave them the opportunity, and many had access to, uh, minting their own coinage. They, the Jews cited that this image was an idolatrous front to Yahweh. Yet here in the temple courts, they don't go outside somewhere and find something. These Pharisees, guess what they have in their pocket? They've got a coin. He calls them hypocrites. The very thing you're trying to pin me on, you're practicing. You hypocrites. And he exposed their hypocrisy and greed for what it is. In summary, the Pharisees, the Herodians, should a Jew pay Caesar's imperial tax? They were amazed. And in our final scene, we meet the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection. They come to him with a question, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if man brother dies and leaves a wife and no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers and they take this idea, it's called Leveret Law, and inside their tradition, there was an understanding that if a man passes away and leaves a wife, the brother could marry them. Now, there's a lot of practical things designed to keep the community moving forward. Not only one's family legacy and lineage and just um, producing children, but also the need for children to manage and grow and live in an agrarian culture. There were practical considerations for that. Um, they pushed this idea some seven times to prove their point. So it's really practical that God had given them a way to keep the farm going, if you will. But you can see the way this is worded here as he confronts them that it's actually not about marriage. He says, look, you don't know the scripture or the power of God. You are badly mistaken, is the last phrase that's used here. When the dead arise, they're going to neither marry nor be given in marriage. They're going to be like angels in heaven. He doesn't say we're going to be angels in heaven. We're going to be like angels in heaven. About the dead rising, have you not read the book of Moses, since this is all you Sadducees believe and trust in, or in the account of the burning bush? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And he affirms this living covenant of promises that he's made to a family, a lineage that will be resurrected again, the patriarchs. And if you want to know more, 
about the whole idea of marriage and what is that in heaven? Garland and Michael and I on sermon notes this past week, we had a good discussion about that. Michael did a great job unpacking that, but it could make for a good Father's Day discussion at lunch too today. What's that gonna look like in heaven? The characters, the Sadducees, how does Leverett Law apply to the afterlife? You don't know scripture, the conclusion, the power of God, and you are badly mistaken. A prolonged, public, and heated disagreement. Contra, against, versus to turn. They've turned against him. He's turned against them. And now as he makes his way, this is probably like on that Tuesday or Wednesday of Passion Week. As he makes his way as a suffering servant, he's now at the center, not just the source. He's the center of controversy and the solution to it. And no one walks away unoffended. This is my question for us this morning. Is Jesus the greatest controversy in your life? Is Jesus the greatest controversy in your life? And while we're not the original audience, remember, to them, for us, there's always this thing behind the thing, a motive, a a barrier, something deep that causes us to miss, to not see or not believe who he is as king or who he is as the Messiah, Christ. And there may be more here, but I wanna uh, finish our time together. I wanna identify five things behind the thing for us this morning as religious people that could cause us as followers of Jesus to not bend our knee to Jesus and see him as our ultimate allegiance. The first one, it's obvious, authority. Or for me and what I struggle with, it's it's, it's not just authority, but it's the loss of power or control. Have you become your own ultimate authority? And the way most days work, you call your own shots. Does the fear of losing power control cause you to walk in unbelief and not trust Jesus as king? For example, it could be for you that you don't want anyone else telling you how you're to handle your sexual ethic. I don't want anyone else to speak into what I'm supposed to do with my body. And we know both the Old and the New Testaments. As we walk as followers of Jesus under the authority of God's word speaks specifically into what a healthy form of that is and how we relate to one another. Or maybe for you it's more of an issue with your possessions or your money or maybe it's unforgiveness that you harbor in your heart or just your pursuit of pleasure. At the end of the day, You're your own authority. You're going to double down on those things, and he has no say in those spaces. That could be your thing behind the thing. To be fair, I am not one who wakes up and walks out my door and goes, sweet, who can I submit to today? I incredibly struggle with that. Is that your thing behind the thing? Or how about this one, fear? You can see it on the screen. Fear of what others think. Three different times they feared the crowd of the people. It's used as a behavior motive on how they made decisions here. Are the other opinions of people causing you to walk in unbelief and not trust in Jesus as king? What other people think more preeminent than what God thinks or Jesus thinks as king, the fear of man. Maybe for you, it's the fear of missing out. That, that's the type of fear that holds you back, the fear of not being seen. For those of you that are active on social media, you live in fear of this. If you post something, you live in fear of what others are gonna think. If you don't post something in response to something, you fear, and what will they think if I don't post, right? It's a conundrum. It's the fear of man. Third one, greed, or it's another face, I think, is comfort many days for us. At the expense of others, have you used your wealth to manipulate or control others? The Jewish leadership did this for their own gain. You see, when Jesus is king, we're generous 
stewards. And while we might not like that word greed, but it could be that that other deceptive face is this idea of comfort as ultimate. As long as my life works, I can have what I want. I want to go where I want, when I want. I want to numb myself, minimize pain. I can do that. I can pay my bills. My life kind of works. Just give me comfort. I don't want pain. So you use others, or at the expense of them, you pursue that. And much of what the Jewish leadership was doing here was rooted in their comfort. Rome had given them a place to reign and rule, somewhat autonomous. They'd just do what they said. They could live comfortable lives. And then the last two here, hypocrisy. Jesus calls them out on that. Another face of hypocrisy, I think, is compromise. For example, some of us in here have compromised the gospel because of our politics. Yes, I said it. We've compromised the gospel because of our politics. And we live in spaces, whether it be our home, maybe it's your family table, whether it be at work, where you're more fear, fearful about being viewed as a liberal progressive or an alt-right conservative than you are about Jesus being the king and the son of God. Fair? Like there's, there's families and there's couples trying to figure out if they're gonna get married in here this morning and Jesus being the son of God is third or fourth down. It's are you a conservative or are you a liberal? Compromise, hypocrisy. In fact, some of us have failed to even let the full teaching of the scripture inform both sides in speaking to every issue there is in life. And then finally, unbelief. Unbelief. The Sadducees, they didn't believe in bodily resurrection. And ultimately, that would be the capstone of Jesus' ministry is bodily resurrection. It could be that for some of us in here, we're struggling because it's hard for us to believe that a man rose from the dead, give us life. Is for you that thing behind the thing, just simply unbelief. But how is he the solution? Let me finish with this. You see, by intention, for him to be the solution, he would have to turn against something himself. That thing would be sin and Satan, the enemy. See, Jesus would turn against the thing that has been our conundrum all these years. Now hear it, and this is what, this is what Mark said from the beginning. Repent, followers of Jesus, those who aren't following Jesus, repent and believe the gospel. Turn against, turn away from your sin and turn to him and trust him. The one with all authority would submit to authority to take himself to the cross. While the shepherds of Israel abdicated their leadership, what is he known as? He's the good shepherd, actually, who lays his life down for his sheep. And while the Sadducees didn't believe, what did he claim? I am the resurrection. It's not just anybody that's going to be raised to life. It's mine. And that perfect sacrifice that was sufficient for the work on the cross, that resurrection is sufficient to give every person in this room eternal life. And so this is what I want to leave you with. Is Jesus causing you to turn against autonomous authority? You be in the center of that. Abuse of power, your need for control, the fear of others' opinions, greed, comfort that hurts others, the slow fade of compromise that makes you a hypocrite? I want to ask you to turn to him and allow him to be the solution to the greatest controversy the world has ever known. He wants it all as king, and he's worth it. Let me pray. Father, on this day, um, I'm grateful that we can come to you because of your son in the power of your spirit and talk with you as a community of faith. Thanks for making a way. Father, uh, thank you for the work of your son. 
and the courage that he had to confront boldly authorities who denied the gospel for the grace that he now, not only he, he extended to them, but the grace that he now extends to us. Help us this week turn away from these things, turn against them, turn to you to live the life you want for us. In Jesus' name, amen.